I give the call to the member for Barton. You seeking leave? I am seeking leave. Yes. Is leave granted? Thank you. I give the call to the member for Barton. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, I rise to make a statement on remote Indigenous housing education in response to the member for Warringah's statement. And I acknowledge the member for Warringah's statement, um, the special envoy for First Nations people. I come to this statement, Madam Deputy Speaker, with a wealth of experience in this area. I was uh, a, a, a school teacher um, and one of the f very early Aboriginal school teachers in New South Wales. I began teaching in 1979. I have spent a long time as an education bureaucrat and was responsible for bringing in, along with my colleagues, the first national Aboriginal education policy. My educational background uh, made, gave me appointment to the Reconciliation Council as uh, having special educational background. I have been an advocate in Aboriginal education and I have also been the Director General of the Aboriginal Affairs Department in New South Wales. I know what I'm talking about. We know that without a proper education, First Nations people will have poorer life outcomes, poorer health outcomes and poorer employment outcomes, and that applies to everyone across the community. We also know, uh, which the member for Oringa didn't address, that the cycle of poverty is what grips so many Aboriginal communities. We know that without, a good education, without decent housing, it is very difficult to have decent health. Without decent health, it is very difficult to have a good educational experience. Without a good educational experience, it is very difficult to have employment. We know that many of the communities that the uh, Special Envoy has referred to are communities that are gripped with poverty and very few um, entrepreneurial opportunities. And that's a very important aspect to understand. Education is critical to improving the lives of our First Nations people. We know that the latest Closing the Gap report, that that gap is still significant. Attendance rates for Indigenous students have been stable between 2014 at about 83 per cent and 2017 also about 83 per cent. Things are not getting worse, but they are also not getting better. The target of closing the school attendance gap between First Nations children and other students by 2018 will simply not be met, and that is on this government's watch. I listened carefully to the member for Rohingya. He talked about the community, but he did not talk about the system. If children are not going to school, there are many reasons for it, and partly it, 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 partly it is to do with the fact that the system does not cater for their needs and does not seem relevant. There is no point having a punitive approach to Aboriginal education and, um, and, the, and the participation rates of Aboriginal students. It is about what's going on, of course, in the community, um, and there needs to be a responsibility there. But there is also a responsibility for what the system is offering or not offering in many cases. In 2017, the overall attendance, rate, attendance rates for Indigenous students nationally was 83.2 per cent, compared with 93 per cent for the non-Indigenous students. What I disappointingly didn't hear anything um, from the member for Warringa was anything to do with early childhood education. We know that if a child gets a good uh, start to a schooling experience where they enjoy it, where they develop a love of learning, where there is opportunity for early childhood education, then that makes an enormous difference in terms of that child's uh, journey through the education system. We didn't hear anything about the first thousand days of a child's life and the, uh, and the plasticity of a child's brain, of course, at that time. The importance of being born at a healthy birth rate. We didn't hear any of those other factors that need to be considered when we talk about children's participation in school. Indigenous attendance is lower in remote areas than non-remote areas, and the attendance gap remains larger in remote areas. I, with, uh, with uh, enormous grace, acknowledge the member for Oringa's work in this area, and I don't doubt his passion and his commitment for one second. I really and truly don't. But of course, on this issue, as on many issues, the two of us do not see eye to eye. 
and we do not agree with all he asserts in his statement. And it remains unclear what role the special envoy for Indigenous Affairs actually entails. Top down does not work. When are we going to learn? Ask the question, what about the system? Punitive approaches of docking welfare payments are not going to uh, transfer automatically into children going to school. I'm not saying that some of the ideas the member for Warringah has put forward don't deserve consideration. They do. I particularly think the first two recommendations have some, um, some significance, and that was, of course, to do with um, working with states in, in, and territories to make it more attractive for people to teach in remote communities, but more importantly, not just to teach but to actually stay in those remote communities for some time to have an effect. Some of the suggestions do have potential for further expo exploration, as I've said including the retention of teachers. I also think there is something to be said about the hex debt for teachers being waived. I do believe that special literacy and numeracy training, as well as cultural training, also is important. But I don't think that we should conflate education with debit cards. I don't think we should conflate education with, uh, with some of the, the direct instruction methods that the, uh, that the member has spoken about. Curriculum development, um, pedagogy and what's delivered and how it's delivered to First Nations children in remote communities is not, is, uh, is not a one-size cookie-cutter um, cookie model. It yeah. needs to be designed with the community. It needs to be designed for the community and it needs to be actually um, very much an individual thing. Understanding what the historical context is in each community for the participation of people in the education system. We know that in the past the education system was complicit with the removal of children. We know that the experiences of many Aboriginal adults at the, in the education system has been very poor. Those historical things are extremely important when it comes to the outcomes for First Nations children. Um, but, but, but we must base this on culture. We must base this on experience. We must, must, must base what happens in schools on the needs of those students, not punitive. And these programs must have proper, uh, proper evaluation. Can I just say, um, in the few closing moments that I have, Madam Deputy Speaker, the member for Warringah puts, points out some real issues that the Abbott Turnbull Morrison government should recognise as being their responsibility. It was on their watch. We cannot rewrite history, but culpable, um, culpability does have to be understood. The government cut $500 million from Indigenous affairs. It closed remote communities and it's cut funding to, rem to remote housing. If a child does not have a decent home, there is no way they can have a decent future and a good educational outcome. Most particularly though, the government has cut education funding to the states and territories, and this is important, having a direct impact on the delivery of education services to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children and the very subjects of the envoy's statement. This government's rejection of the Uluru Statement from the Heart and the proposal for a voice and constitutional reform looms large in the debate. The record of this government on Indigenous affairs is appalling, simply appalling. The record of this government on education is also equally appalling. Before the 2013 election, the member for Warringah promised that there would be no cuts to education under his government. At the 2013 election, the Liberal Party put up core flutes on polling booths saying Liberals will match Labor's school funding dollar for dollar. That was a lie. In the infamous 2014 budget, the member for Warringah cut schools funding by $30 billion. The worst affected schools were public schools, the schools which the vast majority of Indigenous children attend. This includes NT Catholic and independent schools, which will lose $35.9 million. Northern Territory government schools will lose $71 million of federal government funding over the next two years, 2018-2019. But we hope this statement points to a new attitude toward, towards this critical national project, project. And it would be helpful if this government could respond to the interim reports, the power of education from surviving to thriving, to do with Indigenous education, 
uh, produced in May and December um, just in 2017. That would be useful. But we hope this statement, as I said, does point to a new attitude. And we look forward to hearing what the government is actually proposing to do in this area. If we are afforded government at the May election or the next federal election, of course it is our strong hope that the very near, in the very near future a new Labor government will be in a position to make a difference in this area. And if we are afforded government, if we are, we will commit record funding to our nation's public schools, delivering more resources to every school, particularly remote schools. We will roll out three- and four-year-old preschool around the country, revolutionary. Every child will have universal access. We will build our TAFE campuses and waive upfront fees for 100,000 students. We will uncap university places, and we will invest in programs like STARS, which of course supports Aboriginal girls um, staying at school. We support young First Nations girls to stay at school and boys as well. We will value indigeneity, and the funding in relation to domestic violence will not be reduced in these areas. Of course, this, this, is, this, is, this is a taste of what Labor will do. Of course, there is much more. We understand that. But we will work in partnership with First Nations people. That is why our commitment to establishing a voice to the First Nations people is so important. Because only when we sit and listen to First Nations people can we truly find solutions to these very complex issues. We need a real sense of engaged, collaborative partnerships with communities, of engaged parent and community groups being empowered to work with school communities to bridge the gap between home, school and between non-Aboriginal and Indigenous cultural norms and practices. It is First Nations people who will make the difference when we, are, when we, are, we, when we um, listen to First Nations people, where there is equal sharing of power and authority, particularly in respect to education services in remote Australia. In closing, Madam, De Madam De Deputy Speaker, can I thank the member for Warringah for his comments and uh, for his considerations. But I can say with absolute certainty, I have never met a First Nations parent or parents of First Nations children that don't want a good educational outcome for their children, and they will do anything to attain that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well I thank the member.